to give away and lots of great uh, other prize, bike-related prizes. So um, just want to say thanks a lot and please come out and participate in Bike Month this year. Thank you, Duncan. Did you ride your bike in from where? Yes, I forgot to mention. Yeah, I, I bicycled here. I, I bike the talk. Um, I am encouraging people to ride their bikes to get around, and so I do, and I did ride my 50-year-old touring bike over there um, from downtown Olympia to, to get here for the proclamation wow. tonight. So wow, nice. good job. Thank you, sir. 23 miles to go home now. <laughs> Chris, you have something to say? Number one, you're in a school. Are, are you allowed to wear a hat in school? <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, I just wanted to show off my, my safety equipment because that's, okay. the, that's what I lead off with when I do talk to kids around Thurston County because um, I do a program called Safe Routes to School. And so we promote active transportation to and from school around Thurston County. Um, I was just at a bicycle rodeo last night at Olympic View Elementary School up in North Thurston School District um, with over 160 kids participating, wow. uh, which was a pretty big part of the, the total school population there. Um, very enthusiastic about trying out bicycling or learning more about bicycle skills. And they, uh, they're going to be participating, I think, in uh, something that's part of that bicycle uh, commuter challenge throughout the month of May. The first two weeks is a school bike challenge. So that's a way that kids and families can participate in, in the bicycle commuter challenge by doing some of their trips uh, to and from school or in their home neighborhood by bicycle and uh, a great new encouragement for, for young kids to try it out. Uh, just wanted to say from the health department standpoint, um, I work for Thurston County Public Health and Social Services and uh, bicycle to work every day. Um, but whether you choose bicycling or choose walking or uh, even taking transit uh, to and from destinations that you have in town, that active transportation is a, a real benefit to the health of our community. And so we encourage <clears throat> people to give that a try. Thank you very much. And you rode in from Olympia? Uh, I didn't ride quite as far as Duncan. I, I, took, uh, I took a car part of the way and then biked in the, the last six or seven miles. Man, you're brave to be so honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a proclamation. Don't go away. We have a proclamation for you and Duncan. And Duncan's going to get it yeah. too, isn't he? Yep. yep. Okay. Whereas bicycle commuting reduces energy consumption, pollution, and congestion, and is one of the most <laughs> energy efficient forms of transportation ever invented, and is a mode of transportation well suited to urban environments where trips are short in length and overlie congested roads uh, are difficult and costly to expand, and whereas bicycle commuting makes people healthier and more productive and prevents chronic disease through increased physical activity, and whereas Thurston County supports alternatives to inefficient drive alone trips by building bicycle facilities and participating in the wheel options commute trip reduction campaign and whereas inner city transit along with sponsors including the capital bicycling club and many local businesses is hosting the 32nd annual bicycle commuter challenge throughout thurston county during the month of may 2019 now therefore be it resolved the Board of Thurston County Commissioners does hereby proclaim May 2019 as Bicycle Commuter Month in Thurston County and in recognition of Earth Day, National Bike Month and Clean Air Month encourages all citizens to put forth their best effort to reduce single occupant motor vehicle trips to reduce air pollution, energy consumption and traffic congestion. Adopted this 30th day of April 2019 your Board of County Commissioners. Come on up. There you go, Chris. There you go. Thank you, sir. Looking good. Thank you, Thank you very much. Single occupancy vehicles, that, that doesn't include motorcycles, does it? <laughs> just checking. My doc asked if I'm riding my bike, and I said, yep. <laughs> Next uh, in presentations is um, National Military Appreciation Month. 
Okay. And uh, because the month of May is uh, National Military Appreciation Month, and we have with us from the American Legion here in Rochester, we have Louis Zipperer, and from the uh, uh, VFW in Tenino, we have Bob, I'm sorry, Ron Grantham. Yes. Please come up and introduce any folks with you, please. Add to the mic. Thank you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Louis Zipper. I am a member of the Corporal Christopher Nelson Post 49 American Legion Post here in Rochester. Uh, this evening in attendance, we have uh, Chuck Bergeron, our commander, Cesar Morales, our chaplain, and Eric Liang, who is uh, our charter organization representative for scouts, and Steve Mack. Uh, also, I have my daughter who is in the Cub Scouts here with our program, and my son is someplace. And what are their names? Uh, Lucy and Jacob. Right. I met Lucy earlier. She's silly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Come on. Uh, on. Hello. It's an honor to be is bestowed on me to come up here and talk about the very small percentage of veterans that are serving our uh, country. Uh, my name is Ron Grantham. I'm a uh, retired field artilleryman of 21 years. Um, I am the adjutant of both the VFW Post 5878 and American Legion Post 69. And with me, I'm, it's an honor to have the commander of VFW Post 5878 with us, Frank Hicks. Uh, he's a mentor of mine, and I thank you all for having me here. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Everybody here, thank you very much for coming. But don't go away because we have, Gary's going to read uh, the proclamation. And then we have one for you. And I want to thank you all for your service to our country. Because we would not be here if it wasn't for the men and women that have put that uniform on. And some gave all, some gave less, and their families that supported them. So thank you very much. <laughs> National Military Appreciation Month. Whereas the freedom and security that citizens of the United States enjoy today are direct results of the bloodshed and continued vigilance given by the United States Armed Forces over the history of our great nation. And whereas the sacrifices that such members of the United States Armed Forces and of the family members that support them have preserved the liberties that have enriched, enriched this nation, making us unique in the world. And whereas the United States Congress in 2004 passed a resolution proclaiming May as National Military Appreciation Month calling on all Americans to remember those who gave their lives in defense of freedom and to honor the men and women of all of our armed services who have served and are now serving our country together with their families. Whereas the months of May and June were selected for this display of patronism because during these months we celebrate Victory in Europe VE Day, Military Spouse Day, Loyalty Day, Armed Forces Day, week, Day and Week, National Prayer, Day of Prayer, Memorial Day, Navy Day, Army Day, and Flag Day. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Thurston County Commissioners hereby proclaims the month of May as a special time to show appreciation for our military and proclaim it as the national Military Appreciation Month, adopted this 30th day of April 2019, Board of Thurston County Commissioners. So if you gentlemen will come up, and anybody in the audience is also a representation of military, please come up for uh, hand these certificates out and uh, for a photo opportunity, please. Uh, could, could I? No. Uh, uh, no? Yes. <laughs> And I would ask that any other member in the audience with a military background service would come up as well, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
those guys were waiting for me because they didn't think I'd be able to step down here Thanks without here. some help. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. And did we get a picture of everybody here, Brian? Yeah, it's lined up. Uh, maybe we can get everybody kind of up here towards the... Right in the right spot. And uh, I guess I might take just a moment to, to say that I am a proud member of the American Legion here in Rochester as well. Now, uh, we have uh, emergency services, the 2019 snowstorm response, Sheriff's Office volunteers. Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, this is related to the Snowmageddon that we had back in February 8th through the 14th. And uh, as, as you are well aware, is one thing is responding from all, from the county's perspective in terms of cleaning the roads and, uh, and doing everything that we need to do to facilitate uh, mobility to the citizens. Uh, but this particular uh, item for you is to take the time to thank the volunteers. They volunteer many hours, uh, they provide many services to the citizens. So this is an opportunity for you to say thank you. So I will ask Kurt Harding, our uh, Emergency Services Director, to give you additional details on this recognition. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, Kurt Harding, Director of Emergency Services. I'd like to invite our volunteers to come on up. Um, as, uh, as the uh, County Manager uh, spoke, a couple months ago, we had something <coughs> called Snowmageddon. And for, if you remember, as we led up to this, we had situations where we were going to get two inches of snow, we were going to get four inches of snow, we went back to two inches of snow, and then suddenly we got, I think it was eight to ten inches on the first day, and then it kept coming after that. Um, these are the volunteers here, and I wanted to do is say Brian Ryder, Ben Leitner, and Ian Harris, they're representing the other volunteers who couldn't be here tonight, and I want to talk about uh, that they are Blade Diatley, Deanna Brown, Devin Guy, Jason Simmons, Greg Ambrose, Matt Garofino, they could not be here tonight, but here we have the representatives, and also Bill Gillespie, who's the coordinator of these volunteers, because what they did was they stepped up, and on between February 8th and 14th, when the county received enough snowfall to activate the plan, we have a transportation plan with the search and rescue uh, volunteers, and during that time, the volunteers of the Jeep Patrol and the South Puget Sound Mobile Search and Rescue provided transportation to medical staff and patients for two dialysis centers in Thurston County. Also on February 12th, there was an election that was held, and by state law, the auditor had to pick up and secure those election boxes. Um, they turned around and they transported uh, auditor's staff out to the uh, boxes so that they could bring back the ballot boxes as being compliance with state law. Uh, again, Transportation Coordinator Bill Gillespie was invaluable in dispatching the search and rescue to the necessary locations. And also, I have Sonia here, Sonia from our emergency management staff. She was the liaison between emergency management and the transportation volunteers. She would go, hey, can you guys help out? And they would be step up and they would take care of it. I will tell you that they used their own vehicles, donate their time. There were 32 uh, transportation requests that we were able to fulfill. They put in 101 hours, and they did a total of 780.8 miles that they drove in the snow and the ice, uh, getting patients to the dialysis clinics, uh, getting the uh, auditors, election uh, staff out to pick up the boxes, doing all these things, and they did it with a smile, because I was out there one time with them, and you have to imagine that they were on day five, and they were still smiling. So They're I want to say thank you all very much for, for what you did. <laughs> Any comments? No, I just want to say that, again, without volunteers, we have a heck of a time uh, 
getting our our mission accomplished, I guess, from county government. <clears throat> and uh, and Kurt Sonny makes you makes you always look good. So <laughs> okay. yeah, anyway, she does. thank you all very much for what you do, not only during emergencies, but the prep <clears throat> that leads up to that. So thank you very much. Mr. Minister, anything? Just thank you. I've been, you know, uh, learning about all the different types of volunteers we have in Thurston County. I'm always amazed at the services that are provided and the people that step up. So big thank you from, from, my, from my side. And a huge thank you from me, because even in 30, over 37 years in public service, I never got a snow day, but I got paid. You're volunteering to do this. And so I greatly appreciate that. And our, I know our community greatly appreciates it as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right, now we're moving to Albany Street. Uh, yes, uh, I think this is a great opportunity um, for um, the community to hear mm -hmm. about a, a project that we have scheduled uh, here in Rochester. So I will ask Mark uh, Maurer, one of our civil engineers, to come and give us the details of this particular project. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, this project began several years ago uh, when we got our stormwater maintenance and operation crew got some technical assist requests from the, the neighborhood. Um, and I'm going to walk over here and show this on the map. So we had a system of old pipes in this back in the neighborhood, back over in here. And um, those pipes have been very hard to maintain. Some of them are filled with sediment. We can't get the sediment out of them. And uh, so that was causing localized flooding. If you want to stand back a little bit, that okay. first button is a laser. So that was causing localized flooding in some of these areas out here. Um, so one of the things that they did was they were able to go out and clean some of the catch basins, and that helped a little bit, but that didn't really solve the problems. So uh, one of the folks there recognized that this prop piece of property was for sale and approached me and said, what if we bought this piece of property and put a pond in and were able to fix these problems? So that was what the kickoff of this project was. So we did purchase the property, um, and then we had a series of outreach meetings out here. And one of the things that we found out was that there wasn't just flooding in this area, but there was flooding here and here and some other places where uh, the flooding was happening, but it wasn't being taken care of by any of the stormwater facilities that were out there. So one of the things that we did as we went, as this project progressed, is we actually expanded where the pipe system is. So the pipes right now, the original pipes are like going through here. And one of the problems with actually replacing this pipe here is that it goes right under some of the church buildings. Uh, and so it would have been a big disruption for them. So we actually moved the pipe down to the alley. We were able to pick up the flooding here. We were able to pick up Lake Napa here. I actually checked with the Napa folks and they said that they didn't mind losing their waterfront property. So uh, we are going to be replacing a, a dysfunctional dry well here and getting that into a catch basin. And all of that actually will go around. Also, there's also an old pipe that goes across the school property here. So we're taking that pipe out and moving all the pipes out to in our right of way, except for this little piece right here, and then getting it over to this infiltration pond. Um, so that's basically the gist of this project. Uh, by doing that, we'll pick up the, the localized flooding, get it into the pond where it can infiltrate. Now part of this is that right now we have an easement right here because all the drainage is supposed to go to this pipe right here and drain into this easement, this drainage easement that we have here. We're actually plugging the pipes out here and taking them out, so we won't be using that outfall anymore. But we will, we have a, uh, we need another easement on this property, which is for the emergency overflow for the pond. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're having to do uh, out there is to get these easements changed over. Um, I'm really happy to announce that this project, we had actually had it designed and we were going to build it, but we started doing our stormwater modeling, which is basically shows how much rain is falling and how much rain is going to infiltrate. 
the modeling shows us that all the water from this, from this 30 acres that this drains infiltrates into this pond. And uh, that actually is 24 acre feet more than what is infiltrating right now. That 24 acre feet currently is just running off or evaporating. So the, with the Hearst decision, the Department of Ecology put out a stream flow restoration grant program. We applied for a $1.2 million grant and we got that. Yes. So this, the, most of the construction is being paid for by ecology. Because one of the things that this does is the water that infiltrates here has a lag time until it hits the Black River. And it will actually be hitting the Black River, that big flow, those big flows from the winter here will be hitting the Black River between May and September, which is when we have the low flow. So it'll help the salmon runs. So that's another big plus that we weren't actually thinking about when we designed this, but it turned out that that uh, was a result of this project. So, um, so basically when this gets finished, uh, we'll have a, an infiltration pond. There's actually, we've designed a walking path around the pond so people can go over. There's a, a school, there's a walking path around the school right now, and they can, we'll have a crosswalk here. They can walk over and walk over around the path. And there's a little amphitheater there because most of the time this, this pond will not have water in it, but there is a little amphitheater there so that if school groups wanted to go over there or uh, like if they're playing soccer and they want to go over and have team meetings before or after, they can do that over there too, so. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? Any questions? No. Thank you, Mark. You did a good job. We uh, had a previous discussion in the commissioners about the uh, an easement yes. uh, that we might release because it's no longer needed now. Exactly. That, and can you show me where that is? Sure. Uh, so <coughs> right now, this is where the, the, the outfall is for the, the old pipes right now. And this drainage easement goes along this property right here. So what we're doing is we're asked when we actually need to have an emergency overflow for this pond uh, because it's basically required by uh, the stormwater regulations that you have an emergency overflow to keep the wa if the water does get up to the top of the pond and overflows, it doesn't damage uh, surrounding properties. And it's really for the erosion because the, the water would still be going out this way because this, the, the land generally slopes that way anyway. So the water would be going out there, but this would hope, make sure that it had a safe place to go so it wouldn't erode anything. So uh, when we went to the property owners and asked for this easement here, they said, well, since you're not using this outfall here anymore, can you release this drainage easement that's on this property uh, in, it, in exchange for, partial exchange for the, the new easement that we need there? So that, uh, that relinquishment is partial compensation for the new easement that we're getting on that property. And, uh, so that, Craig might be able to answer any other questions, yeah. any other technical questions about that uh, as well, if you have any. Oh, that, answer, that answers all my questions. Is that, that yeah, okay. It does. And uh, the flooding issue has been fixed, it's been taken care of? Well, this pond will take care of that. It'll take care of that. Yeah, maybe, because but basically what we're doing is uh, we're digging this pond down about six or seven feet. So the, the infiltration rates down that low are really, really good. Uh, they're like over 12 inches per hour. That's why this pond is able to take so much water and infiltrate it. The infiltration rates on the top are like two inches per hour. So, you know, we're, you know, 10 inches more per hour uh, at the, down at the bottom of the pond than we are on the surface. So that's one of the reasons that we're able to infiltrate more water there. And Romero brought up uh, also something I hadn't thought of, and that is not just the, her the heavy torrential rain yes. capacity level, but the storm, right after storm, right after storm, the cumulative effect, and that will handle the capacity? Yes, so the, the model, and I think uh, Romero explained that we use a continuous simulation model. Mm -hmm. It's not just a one event model. So really what that does is there's rain gauges all around the county, and uh, those rain gauges, they either have a simulated history or a 50 year history. And so that model takes 50 years of rainfall and actually runs it uh, to, to make sure that the pond, you know, will take everything that's, that's going to it. 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not just a single event or a single year. It's actually 50 years of history that is modeled in, mm. with this model. Okay. And yes, actual Rubio? precipitation, you know, rates from here. So, uh, based you, on the additional information related to the item that you, may, you were considering a couple of weeks ago related to relinquishing the easement, uh, since this is somewhat of a swap from relinquishing an easement, securing an additional easement from the same property owner, so I will bring this item to your attention next week. Good. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Craig, <laughs> did you have thank anything you, you wanted to add? Be no, make yourself available. I thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're so funny. You're so funny. All right, now we're at item number one on the agenda, finally. And this is the uh, opportunity for the public to address the board. However, I have the rules for engagement, and I'll read that off. Uh, number one, La Bonita Bomar, the clerk of the board, ha is the timer, official timer. And different than what we have in uh, our commission hearing room uh, that has a board in it and it buzzes and all that. Uh, it's different. Let me explain it. When I grew up, I was told red means stop, green means go, yellow means caution, so take it slow. Well, tonight it's red means stop, green means go, yellow means hurry up because it's going to turn red. <laughs> and so you have three minutes for comment. And are you displaying it? They can see it. It starts off with a green light. It will last for two minutes and 30 seconds, and then you'll see a yellow light. That means you have 30 seconds left, and then you'll see a red light, and your time is up. If you are midstream in a sentence, go ahead and finish. There's no penalties to finish your, finish your thought, but just please don't go on for a minute, two minutes, three minutes or longer. Uh, there's a fair amount of people who would like to speak. <coughs> Excuse me. So we welcome, as the board, comments from the public uh, but here are some guidelines. We don't respond to the public. This is the time for you folks to address us and we be quiet and listen, believe it or not. Uh, so it's your time to, to comment. Uh, and Romero's taking copious notes. So if there's something that you say that needs follow-up, we'll get follow-up next week on it. And we will ask, or he will know that we're going to ask, to get that follow-up. Um, speakers, you're limited to three minutes to address the board. You cannot donate your time to another person. We reserve the right to restrict a person's opportunity to address the, uh, the meeting for a good cause. Please make sure your phones are silenced out of respect for the speaker. No comments that are lewd or offensive to a reasonable person. We ask please be respectful. I wouldn't imagine it w wouldn't be. No outbursts of any kind. No jeering or booing. No comments that are commercial in nature as, such as a promotion for a for-profit business. And nothing hateful, inflammatory, discriminatory, or uh, or defamatory. Any material that you provide, if, if you speak and you're reading from something, if you want that part of the official record, present it please to Ramiro Chavez. It will become part of the official record and it will be subject to public release upon request pursuant to the Public Records Act, Chapter 42.56 of the RCW. And any remarks about pending land use permits or similar matters that could eventually come before the board on appeal are not uh, allowed either. So I thank you for that, and I'm gonna what I'll do is I'll read your name, the person uh, first on the list, and then I'll, I'll call the batter up so the second person can get in line ready to, ready to speak. And again, when you come up, address the board. Please don't address the audience. And if you can, face us or face the camera so we can get you captured. So first is uh, uh, Chief Robert Scott, followed by uh, Deborah, and I wanna pronounce your name properly, Jaqua? Jaqua? Okay, close enough? Jaqua. I knew it. It's my second guess. Oh, so you'll be next, ma'am. Chief, come on up. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Robert Scott. I represent West Thurston Regional Fire Authority. Uh, this is the agency that uh, covers 168 square miles, basically everything uh, south of the city. You want to get that just a little bit higher to your, your mouth? A little there. better? There okay. you go. Basically everything that uh, covers uh, south of the city limits of Tumwater, all the way to the Lewis County line, and then from the uh, Grace Harbor County line to just shy of Tenino. Uh, we're here speaking in support of uh, the movement of the Maytown North Point uh, development to go on the docket in the future before the board. Uh, anything that uh, brings uh, family wage jobs to our region, which uh, has some economic challenges, uh, along with uh, additional revenue that could come in the form of property taxes to help essential services such as law enforcement and the fire department, 
as well as those other ancillary things that can help out with, uh, such as parks and other type of uh, things. We're in support of that, and we urge the board uh, to look at putting that on the docket for future uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Deborah Jaqua. Oh, there you are. Uh, followed by uh, John Pettit. Let's see if I can get is that working. Oh, yes, it is. You yeah. Bet. All right. All right. Well, thank you, commissioners. I'm I'm really um, appreciative of the opportunity to come and speak before you today to urge you to not put the Maytown development on this year's docket. There are several reasons I feel this way. The property is next to a wildlife preserve and very near Miller Sylvania Park, State Park. <laughs> it makes no sense to have an industrial hub here. It's also more than half a mile from the interstate, which I believe is against the regulations. Uh, furthermore, since there has been mining on the site, the rules of the gravel mines permit prevent any other use afterward. There must be reclamation after it's all done. This is per a, um, a settlement agreement. Um, I think it's 2006. Um, and it's supposed to be reclaimed for future generations. Um, so this rezone request in itself is a non-starter. As far as the request to put this topic on this year's docket, five months after the deadline should also be a non-starter. Where is the criteria for deciding which late applications are approved? It's not fair to the other applicants who have been denied already for this year. You've heard the saying, poor planning does not make it an emergency on my part. Well, I would say that poor planning on the part of the developer should not become an emergency for the commissioners to put it on the docket for this year, certainly. Thank you. I really appreciate your listening. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, John Pettit, followed by Terry Ballard. Good evening, commissioners. I'll oh, get right up there, right up to it. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. I, um, my name is John Pettit. I live in the East Olympia area. I basically, the first thing we start out with the fact is you, you all made a good presentation and talked about how, you know, the South County, this is important, you represent us. I have a very difficult time thinking that you're representing the interest of the people in the South County. When you're seeking to raise property tax by 39.5%. That's the proposal you have under your item number 6A today. Nobody here wants to hear about property tax, but you should talk a lot about it to let us all know why you think that's important. I mean, the particular district for this area, here, he's been in office for four months, and within four months, he's decided we need to raise the taxes, 39.5%. It's ludicrous, ludicrous. Uh, although the ballot position is stated as a means in order to build a future courthouse, if you actually read the ordinances that was prepared, there is absolutely no, that the commissioners are not compelled in any fashion to actually build a courthouse. You can use the funds without any other source. In fact, it says it clearly in there. I've given you documents before. Unfortunately, your county manager didn't want you to have the documents before during the last meeting so you could go through it and look at it. I mean, it doesn't do us much good to make a comment if it's all being pushed aside so you only get your selected portions. Uh, the methodology of bringing the proposition for a vote of tax increase, levy led as opposed to revenue bonds conditioned upon building a facility was explained by the county manager uh, to me, Mr. Chavez. A vote for revenue bonds requires a 60% voter approval rate. Well, I think that's a pretty big thing when you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, of which would be difficult to get the proposition approved by voters. Those are words from the county manager. He's not supposed to have an opinion. He's supposed to be serving us as citizens and voters. But 
A simple vote to lift the levy lid for a tax increase only requires 50% voter approval plus one vote. So we want to time this election out in order to not, in order to not have the full depth or the full volume of people to be able to have a, a chance to say no. There's something wrong with that. When people seek to put their own interest above the citizens, they should be removed from the positions of public trust. I'm questioning a little bit about public trust in all of you because you need to be very clear with everyone here about how you want to raise their tax for Thurston County by 39.5%. Thank you. And Terry followed by Glenn Morgan. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Terry Ballard. I own uh, three properties in Thurston County, two in Unincorporated and one in Olympia. I am a 35-year veteran, uh, Army veteran, and retiring in 2012. A uh, couple points made that you made is, do things go to the public record? I have no clue. I've given you plenty of things to go to the public record. And as far as responding next week, I have no response in months. Okay? Absolutely not. You have a transportation tax district that was illegally joined. And Mr. Bud Blake had to wait until two commissioners came on board that were in unincorporated Thurston County. And it reads, the district shall dissolve itself and cease to exist 30 days after finance of or debt service on the transportation improvement mm -hmm. or series of improvements constructed is completed and paid. Um, why do we need a transportation tax uh, benefits district when we're already paying $31,000 a mile to repair our roads, which, which millions goes out of the road fund? Why do we do that? Next one. The last week on Tuesday, I heard something about a pocket gopher. Well, we've been trying to get rid of this pocket gopher for quite a while. <clears throat> now, there's a stay on all these, uh, there should be a stay on all these plats and all these permits that require a pocket gopher inspection. Having property in Olympia, I know they have none. And their comment is that all these pocket gophers move to the unincorporated parts of Thurston County. <laughs> and that's the truth. There is no permit process, there is nothing, no permit for plats, no permits for anything to build, for a pocket gopher to build in uh, uh, in Olympia. Why is that? One of you ran on getting rid of this pocket gopher, okay? And it's two in two years and change now into it. Why are we still putting up with an un unresolved rodent, okay? I, I cease to remember that. Now, as far as my, uh, uh, in, I, I live in unincorporated Thurston County and we have a thing called a septic tank tax. Well, I know a lot about stormwater. And it was the stormwater that eight years ago was resolved, and I'm still paying this tax for a fee. I call it a tax, it might be a fee. Why am I still doing that? All the paperwork shows that my, my septic tank has no problem, okay, even though I have three, um, uh, I have three wells down in my, in my park. Uh, as far as a 100-year storm, nothing's supposed to go directly into uh, uh, into the oceans, into the sea streams, n none of the storm, uh, storm water. Storm water is permitted to you to run from the Department of Ecology. I don't understand why somebody has to give an easement or something for something that you should own and you should take care of. And we pay storm water fees to you to do that. Why should we occur the cost for that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Morgan, followed by Donna Weaver. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, it's uh, always good to be here. I'm glad to see you in South County this time. Uh, I live uh, between Tenino and Rochester. My name is Glenn Morgan. And uh, first, I want to support everything that uh, Chief Scott came up here and mentioned earlier. Uh, in South County, we absolutely do need jobs. Uh, Thurston County, particularly in the planning department, has made an, has made an active effort to do everything they could to destroy any kind of commercial activity or uh, business in South County and that effort to destroy jobs has been uh, effective at, at uh, doing so and we need 
uh, opportunities like this where we actually have tax paying businesses that move in and hire people locally particularly uh, unfortunately most of the development in the Grand Mound area is being done on tax free uh, tribal land and so we don't actually have the same tax benefits locally uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is a strong opposition to item number 6a on the budget or on your agenda here today which is the uh, proposed uh, property tax increase and this is the largest tax increase in recent Thurston County property tax increase in Thurston County history proposed. And uh, I'm most concerned that it's attempting to also to avoid the voters by pushing for an April date for the vote rather than a November vote uh, date when actually you'd have more voters participate. And I realize that the supporters of this project believe that uh, they want as few voters to participate as possible because they know that if more voters know about it, they'll reject it. Uh, and I think that it's unfortunate that staff's kind of playing into that project. This is probably one of the most significant projects that's been uh, proposed in recent county history. Uh, mostly with the people I've spoken to about it, and that's been hundreds so far in South County, uh, are extremely disgusted by it. And it reminds them of the uh, Valenzuela and Romero era. But, uh, and particularly, I know Pettit mentioned this earlier, but uh, the general obligation bonds provide no guarantee at all to the citizens that anything actually be built. All, the only guarantee we get is that there's going to be a tax increase, and there's no guarantee that anything happens after that. So I think this was just a bad and poorly thought out project, which really brings me to a bigger concern, which is that the process we went through to get to this proposal, I think, was flawed. And we really, particularly, we don't want to be rewarding uh, the failure to properly maintain the existing courthouse, something that's been bragged about by staff, uh, willingly letting the roof leak, willingly letting the place fall apart over the last 20 years in an aggressive effort to let it decay and use that as an excuse then to suddenly spend hundreds of millions more dollars and therefore justify this tax increase. I think that uh, had we allowed more efficient and effective options to be considered in the process and not killed early on, we would have been able to consider something that's a lot less expensive. The courthouse has two problems, parking and space. Uh, we can solve the parking problem with a lot less money, and we can solve this uh, space problem. We moved out the jail. There's plenty of room down there for the planning department and other groups to, to be located. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Donna, followed by Sally Knoll. Let me be the first uh, up here at the microphone to thank you for coming down to South County to have a little visit with us down here. It is much appreciated. I'm sure that uh, Gary's expecting me to talk about uh, a circus coming to town, but I'm not going to. I would, number one, like to ask that uh, uh, my voice be heard in no courthouse in downtown Olympia. Uh, if you're going to build us a new courthouse, let's do it in Rochester or Grand Mound or Rainier or Tonino where the traffic's not so bad. All right, now on to my main item. I'm sure you've heard about the federally designated opportunity zone which Rochester has now become a part of. The area consists of Grand Mound at I-5 all the way through Highway 12 to the Grays Harbor County line. The federally designated opportunity zone is encouraging prospering in the community through business investment. I am asking with this opportunity, with the federal designation that's been placed, that we have the opportunity to create business here, which in turn will create prosperity in the community, provided our local government can find a way to say yes when the permits are requested. I would ask that as commissioners, you help design a process for permits to be acquired by the standard business owner in a reasonable and predictable manner. Given that we have this opportunity granted to us in this area, that we work towards that and create a prosperous area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sally Knoll and then uh, Larry Weaver. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Uh, my name is Sally Knoll, and I live near Millersvania State Park. I just moved in there. Um, I still have more <clears> boxes <throat> than square foot walking space. But um, my son-in-law bought that property, and he did his due diligence. We bought 40 acres of what he thought was going to be a heaven. And he's a, a retired military, and he wanted peace and quiet, and he did 
two years of research before he bought that property to make sure the zoning was all right, that things weren't going to change, that it was going to stay beautiful. It was going to stay pristine. It was going to stay a place people wanted to come and visit and find peace and quiet. Um, now we understand that right across from us, I mean, almost friggin' in our backyard, is going to be maybe this huge North Point industrial something or other. And it's going to be lights, it's going to be trucks, it's going to be noise, it's going to be Millersvania is my next door neighbor, and it's a minute away, a minute away to have so much noise and traffic. And one of the things he found out when he was doing his research about the gravel mine, that was the only thing that was a little tiny bit, hmm, I'm not quite sure if that's going to stay stable, was that there was an agreement with Audubon about that gravel mine and the agreement goes with the property. It doesn't go away when the property is sold. I don't quite understand the legal ease of all that, but it stays with the property. And it, that statement is that when the gravel, gravel mine is no longer being used, that it goes back, it reverts back to nature so it can join the fish and wildlife <clears throat> next door to it. So it can stay it can come back to nature. So we have a larger, we have a thousand acres of peace and quiet and frogs and all those things. And as far as jobs go, you know, it'd be nice, we, we need jobs, but we don't need jobs that are gonna destroy <coughs> Thurston County. I mean, that, that industrial thing will absolutely destroy Millersvania State Park. It's gonna be so many trucks, so much light, so much pollution that people won't go to Millersvania anymore because it's gonna be just lights and noise. And we could be the county that saved its pristineness and people will come just like they, when they built the, the, the baseball field in that movie, you know? People will come if you build it. We can build pristine environments that we save and we keep so people can come and enjoy them later. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Larry, followed by Gene. Commissioners, I'd like to uh, echo my appreciation for you visiting our uh, neighborhood this evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, three quick things, well, two quick things and a, and a third. Uh, I'd like to uh, voice, and I would intend on, if it's on the ballot, to demonstrate my opposition to a new courthouse. Um, been a long, sore subject each time it's been talked about in years past. Uh, I, I don't think that's a, a wise use of uh, uh, our tax dollars. Uh, I'd also like to support the uh, drainage project that's going on in Rochester. Uh, that easement that is being asked to be given up in exchange for a different kind of an easement, uh, the easement that was originally created is a 15-foot wide transport easement. It was never intended and uh, uh, written up as it was, it was not a pond. It was a transport easement to take the drainage on through a system onto Black River. But that the, the culverts have since been eliminated that went underneath Highway 12, so there is no transport with that existing easement today. Uh, and uh, there is no legal uh, opportunity for the county to utilize that 15-foot wide, 1,000-foot-long uh, easement for a pond facility. Uh, so I would support, I support the drainage project, uh, and I also support the elimination of that easement, uh, the present easement, in exchange for uh, another uh, ponding easement on that property. Third item is, uh, Shortly after uh, Commissioner Mincer took office, I ambushed him with uh, some information regarding nitrate levels in South County. Uh, years ago in the 90s, uh, staff had presented to a, in a commissioner's meeting a graph showing a trend that this, due to septics, that the nitrate levels would certainly uh, end up being uh, at a uh, contamination level into the mid-2020s. Uh, uh, we provided opposition at that time, opposition research from the Rochester Water Association, of which I am a director, uh, indicating that that was not the case. Our, our statistics shown in our nine uh, city water wells surrounding the county that the nitrate levels were not in danger of contaminating uh, our aquifer. And shortly after Commissioner Mincer took office, we had done uh, a November study, uh, which, which we do on a regular basis every 90 days, and that November study 
uh, of, of 2018 indicated nitrate levels were virtually identical to when we first started keeping records back in 1967. So there, we want to, I want to demonstrate uh, that as uh, in contradiction to what you'll hear from staff, health department staff from time to time. We do not have a nitrate level uh, issue here. Septics are not a problem in South County. And uh, we, I echo Donna, my sister Donna's uh, information about we encourage the commissioners to uh, incur be uh, 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 growth oriented in South County uh, with this new bi federally uh, 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 business uh, 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 designation for our area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gene Weaver, followed by Carrie Hart. Good evening. Good I evening. would also like to commend you and uh, thank you for coming down and uh, listening to our uh, <coughs> summation of problems. And uh, yeah, you're right. I can't uh, even summarize my uh, presentation in three minutes, so I'll just, but I want to follow up on Larry's uh, statement there, and also another factor that was involved um, and has been going on for many years is the fact that this aquifer that we set above is a stagnant pool that'll eventually drain itself and, and we'll pump all the water out of it. And I just want to make the comment that I, I'm I've been president of the Rochester Water Association for over 50 years now, and we have records running back a long time. Our wells at this point in time are approximately the same level they were when we, the water, static water level is approximately the same level that it was when we drilled the wells 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, uh, but I come today to resurrect a, uh, uh, something that keeps resurrecting itself in this community pertaining to the aquifer because back about six, seven years ago, I spent, well, quite a few members of the community, I think 11 or 12 of us, spent uh, two years on a one-year study of the aquifer here. And uh, we came up to everyone's surprise that there was no problem. And uh, during this thing, uh, this study, I wrote a letter to our, my fellow committee members and uh, summarizing 40 years of studies and down zonings and things that has happened in this area that I have in my records and I've itemized them. I wrote a letter, I itemized it, and I gave it to the county commissioners at that time and the Board of Health and things. And uh, continually, we, every so often, up comes the problem that we, we don't, we're polluting the aquifer. Well, this study finally, finally, uh, the computer models show that uh, we're getting better and better and better. Our nitrate levels are going down for several reasons, wellhead management mainly. And so I submitted a couple of letters to the commissioners and uh, back at that time, a different board of commissioners, and I, there's been no response. Uh, and we keep repeating over and over again, uh, the, these things rise up about this delicate, uh, delicate aquifer and we need to protect it and on and on. I'm going to resubmit the letters tonight to this board and, and I would like to, you know, maybe we can get some uh, response and, and include the history that we have done. We've taken away 100,000, in my estimate, building sites away from this area already and uh, through zoning and, and septic regulations and things. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Carrie Hart, followed by Eric Johnson. Commissioners, 
uh, county manager and county staff. My name is Kerry Hart and I reside at 1505 Summit Lake Shore Road in West County. Later this board will consider either to proceed or stop the process of a special election for a special district at Summit Lake. Considering that at the public hearing, 60% of the comments were not in favor of a special district, conducting a special election would be a waste of county's staff time and the taxpayers' money. Please do not go forward with a special election. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Eric Johnson, followed by Steve Chamberlain. Hi, and thank you for letting me speak tonight. <clears throat> I'm a resident at Summit Lake and I've been out there for 15 years. I would encourage you to not form a special lake district. I think it's a big waste of tax dollars. If you form the special lake district, our taxes will go up and now I'm hearing that you want to raise our taxes for another project too. We're paying enough taxes at Summit Lake. Our tax rate has a multiplier of 1.6. So we're paying half again as much in taxes as the rest of the county. We don't get services that justify that kind of tax rate. A couple years ago, my wife found a man wandering by our house with 30 degree ambient temperature with just underwear on. We called the sheriff's department. 45 minutes later, they hadn't showed up. We called and they said they didn't know when they were gonna come out to help us. They never did show up. They never called to see if we needed assistance again. This last summer, we had a fire at the end of the lake, and I was informed that our local fire department didn't show up, the fire uh, house that we have at the lake, that they had to respond from town. So what am I getting for my increased taxes? I'm not getting increased services. So I would submit that the county needs to help us with this problem and not shrug off the responsibilities that you have by forming a special lake district. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Steve Chamberlain, followed by uh, Christine Hartman. Good evening. My name is Steve Chamberlain. I've been a resident of uh, unincorporated Thurston County for close to 50 years now. I'm also uh, <coughs> a product of the Rochester area. My family uh, operated three large dairy farms here back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s until the economy changed and uh, the farms kind of died out. Um, <clears throat> back in the 80s, I was a special consultant with the county to bring and encourage um, sewers into the Grand Mount area. And as a part of that, that process, I recall in meetings like this, um, telling the audience and the folks here in, Thurston, in, in South Thurston County that this was going to bring economic development and jobs and, and growth to the South County area. And 30 years later, why the, uh, the system did get built and there is some growth occurring here. Uh, I'm here tonight simply as a citizen uh, concerned about economic development, growth, and jobs. And as uh, most of you know, jobs is a big issue for, the area, for this area in, in South County. Uh, earlier today, I attended one of your staff meetings and it was brought up about the unemployment rates both in, in Thurston County and also in the Rochester area. And I just wanted to point out again that nationally, you know, we've been seeing and hearing the unemployment rates at historic lows somewhere in the upper threes. I believe I heard that, that in Thurston County, it's in the upper fives. In the Rochester, South County area, it's twice that or more. And I would just uh, encourage the commissioners that uh, you have an opportunity here that some of your previous uh, commissioners uh, didn't take or, or wouldn't take to encourage growth and economic development and create good family wage earning jobs in this part of the county. Having been here this long, I've watched the changes that have occurred both in the South County as well as the North County, and as, as you all know, most of that development and those jobs have all gone to the North and to the Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater area. And I think you have an opportunity before you to change that and to bring some economic prosperity, jobs and growth down here to support the people in South uh, Thurston County. You've heard from the uh, fire chief, uh, you've heard from some of the other folks who are impacted by unemployment, you, by impacted by 
a lack of economic development. And I, I just want to encourage you that as you deliberate on policies, requirements, development standards, and, 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 and projects that could bring jobs to Thurston County, that you think about how you can do that for South Thurston County. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, Christine Hartman, and followed by Kevin O'Sullivan. Hello. I just came here to tell you how much I appreciate you and how much I appreciate Thurston County. But I also know this country is on the precipice of serious things. We're going to go one way or the other. I don't know if you guys are realize how serious it really is. And that concerns me for our county, because I love this county, and I want to see it stay protected and pristine. And I've been involved for the last 20 years on the, on the surface of it, talking to the commissioners, because I care so much. And I want you to serve the people of this county, not the globalist, but the people. There's a revolution going on right now in this world, and it's for the people, because they're waking up and they're taking their power back. And I want government to serve the people. And I love you all, so I'm talking to my friends, t to be honest. I love all of you. But I want you to do the right thing, because this is a war, a spiritual war, between dark and light. And if you listen to God within you and follow your heart, you'll do the right thing. I know it. I believe in you, all of you, very much. Gary, Hutch, and my new friend. I believe in you. And I surround Thurston County with a wall of love that no one will in invade this county or ruin this county. So be it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan followed by Sh Sharon Coons. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Everybody hear me? My name's Kevin O'Sullivan. Um, I am here to speak about two things. And the first thing is going to be the courthouse. When I was county commissioner a number of years ago, the commissioners at that time took great pride in keeping our, our house for the people. Painted, HVAC systems worked on, make sure a healthy environment for the employees. And I am saddened to go up there, like I was today, and to see the paint falling off. It's just, it's horrible. And, and so I am against spending $300 million and going downtown Olympia where it's unsafe. And it's, it's not right. I think we should look at other alternatives. But I will have to tell you, I'm going to do everything in my power to work against if you guys put it on the ballot. The second thing I'm going to talk to you about, because I'm chairman of the food bank, Tenino, uh, which today we had a meeting, and we talked about our numbers that are growing. The reason it's growing is because there isn't enough employment. There isn't enough houses. And so one of the things that I brought up was this, this North Point project that it would bring to Maytown a tremendous amount of jobs, 3,500 to 4,000 jobs in our community, which is going to bring family wage jobs. Now, all of us, as we all know, there was a $16 million mistake that was made by the prior commissioners that the city or that the county residents are going to have to pay for for a long time. We got to stop and we've got to be thinking about jobs because. We have hunger out there. Millen Sylvania Park, I heard the lady talking about that. Well, you know, we have homeless kids in there. I bet you guys didn't know that. You know, there's no other alternatives for them. So I am in strong support of putting this on the docket. And let's, let's get down to business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Koontz, followed by Josh Stottlemyre. I'm short. Am I close? Okay. 
Sharon Kuntz, um, fourth generation un unincorporated Thurston County resident. Um, live on the west, live in West Olympia, but I'm a leader of the Friends of Rocky Prairie, one of the people who's been in it for a long time. We find it offensive that North Point applied for this permit under what we consider false pretenses, saying on the application form to our county that there's no specific project associated with this request. But when I met with you, each of you knew about a project on that, on that request, but it was never put in the application. So that's one that's being kept secret from the public with the evasive application. And due to that statement on their application, then they failed to provide the, the um, supplemental information that, one was re that would be required if they'd admitted that there was uh, a project, and that information is very important. If you see their supplemental requirement checklist, you'll see missing, okay? Um, at least a couple of you told me you'd not read the application, and I have read it, and I want, I, I'm astounded at the number of falsehoods in it, so I'm just going to give you a, a few of them. They claim that the property used to be rural, resource, industrial, and they just want to bring it back to that. No, for years it was rural, residents, one per five, and it just got 300 acres changed to become a gravel mine, which has been a gravel mine. I think that was around 2000, but the staff can tell you I'm not sure of it now. Uh, so that was joined, that was the only part that was uh, zoned rural resource industrial. Um, they also claim that previous uses included heavy traffic. No, for years it was an isolated powder plant out there and then a very limited gravel mine. There's been no, no heavy traffic that would certainly come with this project that we're not real sure of, but we've had some hints, including that last speaker who said 4,000 jobs. Boy, there's some traffic for you right there. And that doesn't include the trucks and such that will be bringing things in. They put up and they knock down in their, in their um, application a straw dog. They say, um, you need to know that the site has never been used as one house per 20 acres and never can be. That down zoning was just to remind the county if the gravel mine permit didn't, didn't go through that it couldn't be used as industrial. But the fact is the mining permit was approved, which meant the settlement and the special use permit kicked in. And after that permit, the, rule, the, the permit rules, the, uh, rules apply and the land has to be reclaimed for, for, as one speaker said, for future generations even. Um, another falsehood, they claim a significant portion of the property is severely degraded. The port's own website points out, no, only 7% of it was. We get a hint of their plans when they say on their, in, in their application, industrial warehousing would be low impact. They told you apparently 4,000 employees and 6 million square feet of warehouse, even if it's 1 million, that's a huge impact on the sensitive critical aquifer and the endangered species there and next door, not to mention all the traffic from those alleged employees and the delivery trucks. When Port of Tacoma first came up with this idea, they said there'd be about 2,800 trucks a day. <laughs> then they say, changed it to 4,000. They verified that when we asked them. This might not be the exact same plan. We don't know. But we do know because the port is, well, we don't know because the port is delaying our legal requests for documents. But we do know it's similar and it spells disaster for South Thurston County residents and the park. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Josh Stottlemyre followed by Amy. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak today. My name is Josh Stottlemyer. I'm, I'm here representing the um, Experience Olympia and beyond the uh, Thurston County Visitor and Convention Bureau. Uh, I have a prepared statement that the uh, board and the staff there has approved that I'd like to read. <clears throat> um, as you consider the impacts of rezoning the Rocky Prairie, we encourage you to consider the economic and experiential impacts to our local tourism industry. Thurston County, known for its scenic beauty with our organization promoting a handcrafted experience. The phrase, uh, I'm sorry, handcrafted escape. The phrase escape is intentional as this region serves as a reprieve from the hustle and bustle of other destinations. This is a place to relax and unwind, a destination we are also known for being uh, nature loving. We are equal friendly, mm -hmm. serene, and rejuvenated by nature. Visitors are drawn to the area, support local small businesses, and stay in hotels because of these experiences. Our role is to create memorable experiences. State parks are a place where families and friends create cherished memories that last a lifetime. As more people find themselves living in cities, 
State parks are often the only opportunity for some kids and adults to interact and explore nature. This access helps individuals feel better about themselves, relieves stress, enhances family opportunities, and reduces crime. We would be concerned about the potential impact on this area should the North Point project move forward. Instead of enjoying the serenity of nature that comes with camping, boating, and playing in nature, the increased noise um, from the project will affect the 378,000 annual visitors to Millersvania State Park. Uh, and those are just the paid visitors. Uh, 53,000 of those also spend the night there. Imagine having all the trucks drive by. We would also be concerned about the potential impact for other tourism attractions, such as Rutledge Corn Maze, uh, right down the road, Sandstone Distillery, also right down the road, and all of the attractions in Tenino uh, that would be affected by the heavy traffic and large trucks, which would intimidate visitors. We would, we would hate for this to deter visitors from exploring the region. We are proud that tourism is a top contributor to the region's economy. Tourism generates more than $321.4 million in direct spending for, um, for our region. These dollars support local small businesses, generate taxes for important local investments, balance economic development, enhances the local quality of life. We hope you will consider local and visitor experiences uh, in your decision moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, also throw out a caveat. In the very beginning, I suggested if you have any written material, uh, please supply it to uh, the county manager. And everybody's uh, verbal testimony is captured uh, historically. But if you have something electronic, feel free to email it wherever you wish to do so that we have that if you want it to be part of the record. And uh, Amy, please come up, followed by uh, Jeff Merriman. Lower this, excuse me. Good evening. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk. Um, I'm a teacher in Thurston County as well as an owner of a small business. Uh, when we chose a site for our business, we looked within county regulations and picked a light industrial site um, because we wanted to be responsible citizens and choose to be in the correct location for our business. I live a mile from the proposed North Point location and I thought there'd be like a few trucks. Hearing today that there's 4,000 trucks makes my stomach sick. Um, the noise pollution, the light, I, as a teacher, I feel for homeless kids, I do. But we have places in our community, including by the airport, that are zoned light industrial and industrial. We need to stick to zoning. You guys did a fabulous job. I don't know. You guys did a fabulous job a few years ago rezoning, um, and we picked to live in a rural 1-5 zoning. We wanted to stay away and be in nature and in peace. And rezoning, jumping from 120 to industrial is, in, is insanity. And I realize that there's jobs, and jobs are important, but we have to protect our park. We need to worry about property values nearby. There are other areas. It is not our job to bail out the port of, of Tacoma. That's their problem. Now let's stick to the plan and maintain the current zoning, please. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, Jeff Merriman. Okay, thank you for coming down here to South County. Um, I understand why the sheriff's here now. You guys have a hard job with my uh, fellow residents. <laughs> so um, we all know why I'm here, <laughs> cannabis, farming. Um, pretty much you guys have pushed into industrial zones throughout the county, which then uh, pushes out wage, family wage jobs I belong to a company that was pushed out for a cannabis farm, um, so we lost five good union jobs right here, pushed out of county. Um, I'm asking that you guys maybe do like community outreach, put together something to look at, maybe ask community members, industry members about bringing it back. I mean, how many 30-year-olds are excited about agricultural? None. How many 30-year-olds are excited about agricultural that is cannabis a lot bring them in I mean not only do I grow cannabis on top of my aquifer and I grow it Korean natural farming style I also grow other things I also bring knowledge into my community I mean looking at what we have with North Point it's great 
location, from a business standpoint, I don't think that company cares about us here. They just look at the railways that are there. Um, it's out in the middle of nowhere. They can probably get it cheap. Um, who knows, automation's here. They could put it up there. Everyone's looking at 300 jobs. It could be three jobs. We don't know. Nobody knows. So I ask that maybe we bring some farming back here to our area, um, especially with the hemp bill that passed. Hemp and cannabis, they smell the same. The only difference is a cannabinoid. Um, and right now, you can't control hemp farming out here, so we're going to get conventional farmers. I, have a, I see the older generation in this room. Maybe them or their parents helped deplete our soil with conventional farming and chemical farming. I think using cannabis, we can regulate the market out here to you can only grow organically. Therefore, we preserve our soils and we go back to having fertile soils here. That's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, that, that exhausts the sign-up list. Oh. oh, no, it doesn't. Good grief. Where'd you put that? Man? Okay. Right. Uh, we're getting to the end, though. Next is uh, Dalton Johnson and uh, uh, Jan Tibetan, in that order. snug up on me. Good evening, County Commissioners. Uh, thank you also for me for you folks coming down to our community. Um, I am here uh, representing the organization that operates the Haasfield Sports Complex in Grand Mount Rochester. Um, and I want to talk to you tonight because we are currently looking for ways to um, bring a much needed uh, renovation, uh, some capital improvements to our facility. Um, our vision is to actually uh, be able to provide park services to this community. Um, we don't currently have any provided um, from any form of government. We, as you know, do not have city government. Um, uh, Rainier, Tenino, Yelm, for instance, all have city governments, but they do receive park services from Thurston County. Uh, we don't, though we do pay taxes. Um, so uh, we've got some ideas um, for uh, how we might be able to bring some capital improvement to our facility. Um, we have met, our groups met with county parks management. Um, we would love to uh, meet with our commissioner, uh, Commissioner Menser, and, and with the rest of the board as well, given the opportunity. Um, I won't go into a tremendous amount of detail, but um, we think that if, if we can actually uh, get some capital improvement to our facility, um, we can provide a true community park as opposed to what we have right now, uh, which is a really dilapidated sports only facility, essentially. Um, we'd, we'd like to actually have a community park um, that can be used. Um, there are uh, also local precedents for uh, public-private partnerships, that, that sort of thing. But you know, I won't go into a lot of detail. We've got some great ideas, I think. Um, just would, would love to have the opportunity to meet, um, you know, outside of a forum like this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Mr. Tibetan, you're next, and then followed by uh, Bertie Davenport. Oh, can you come get that, Romero? We'll go right here, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Can you get, my get, get that? Go. We're just going to adjust the mic for you, Mr. Tibetan. Thank you, sir. In the early 1990s, I questioned the location of the 100-year floodplain in the area downstream from 183rd Avenue. I collected flood data, took pictures, and submitted it to FEMA. To everyone's surprise, FEMA, FEMA staff uh, concluded that I, was, that I was correct. However, it was not the time at that time to correct the official maps. That was 25 years ago. In the meantime, I have worked with Tim Rupert of the county staff, and using my 25-year-old uh, data, he convinced FEMA to study the Scotty Creek area as part of the study that they have made for Jehaldis River. 
as I understand it, the new date for issuing the corrected maps is this coming August. Now, why is it so important that the FEMA maps are, are correct? It is because the 100-year flood line designates the flood area, and if you have a mortgage from a bank, then they require you to have mortgage insurance, flood insurance, if you are within the floodplain. Uh, in 1990, my boys and I built a house for one of my boys, and uh, it was not within the floodplain as we knew it. And I had talked to old timers that lived in the community, and they said, no, 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 it's not in the floodplain. <clears throat> however, however the, the incorrect FEMA maps indicated that it is. And if you look on page two of the map, you will see the old line and the new line. And they are about 200 feet apart. And my, the house that I built was in the middle of that. Now, the flood insurance for that house would have been about $1,000 a year. I refused. I did some data research and, and the pictures and all that good stuff. And they have now corrected the maps. And it will come out, like I said, in, in August. Now, that boy would have paid $1,000 a year plus and that would have amounted to, in the last 25 years, over $30,000. Now, I plead with you to stay on top of that FEMA project to make damn sure that they do not delay the <clears throat> issuance of the corrected maps. It's, it's enough problem that has been created. Now, I have one more subject I would like to mention, and that is the, the gopher and FEMA. Yeah. I'm colorblind. You're going to have to scream and tell me when that's up. But my boy has just not finished the house that we got the permits to, to the FEMA process, through the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife process. But here's what he had to do to get it. He had to prepare an HCP, 60 pages, 20 pages of conservation easement, legalese. He had to commit to an annual inspection fee of $600 in perpetuity. Uh, it took 20 months to get the building permit. It took four and a half months to build a house. Todd's residence is the only residence on Rochester Prairie that has been approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, branch office in Olympia, regional office in Portland, Washington, D.C., and published in the National Register for 30 days for nationwide comments. There was no comments. Uh, I, I, you know, you are on a good way to 25 years, similar to what FEMA was. And it's about time you get that damn HCP that the county has submitted to U.S. Fish and Wildlife worked on. At the last commission meeting, staff reported that the project was on hold. That's not good enough. You are adversely impacting residents of this area. Last one. Last one, why don't you buy one of the abandoned gravel pits and make it into a park, just like we had done by Elma. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kindly appreciate that. And now we have exhausted the list. I've checked the, the list several times. There is, a, however, if you came in late, or you found the courage, or you thought, hey, I'd like to join the fun, uh, you're welcome. Oh, Bertie, you're next. All right, Bertie. I'm sorry. Come on up. I did it again. <laughs> Prepare yourself, because after Bertie, if you want to come up and address uh, the board, if you haven't already tonight, you're welcome to. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for coming down. Uh, I live in Rochester, and um, I'm a conservationist and a restoration practitioner. So, well, there's a lot of different folks here. Um, I wanted to speak about the Maytown property and the incredible values of Rocky Prairie West, or West Rocky Prairie. Um, it's, a, it's a regionally important site as a prairie and oak woodland site, and the, the property that's being used for a gravel mine now also includes oak woodlands and prairie habitats. And so I think that you should um, 
look carefully at the values of that property and have staff and uh, experts um, advise you about it. Um, if you're going to move forward with uh, the property development that's proposed. And so that's basically all I have to say. It's a really critically import important property and you should be extremely careful moving forward and looking at the values that are adjacent to it and also on that property itself. So uh, I've been there and I've looked at it and I'm an experienced ecologist, so I'm just, um, just giving you caution that you should look at it carefully. Right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Believe me, that's it now. <laughs> uh, is there anybody else that would like to address the, uh, the board? You're welcome to come on up. Yes, sir. Just ask you to state your name again and uh, for the record about where you live in the county. My name is Ron Grantham. I, I talked a little bit earlier. Um, so I've been living here since 2017. I've been in Germany for the last 18 years. Um, beautiful country, absolutely. Uh, I had no idea that I had to put my name on a list or anything to come up here and talk, but I would have done it earlier because I have some small issues, uh, not as great as some of these other people out here. I'm also an environmentalist. I have a degree in environmental science, and I love pocket gophers. I hope you don't kill them off. But um, one thing I do is I walk eight to 10 miles a day. And a lot of people don't walk, so they don't get to see the garbage that we have in our county, in our state, and it really bothers me. And I think it's a big issue. I'm not just talking about some of our issues that are very important down here in the county, in the city, and something like that. But the garbage is eventually going to flow into our oceans. And if you've done any research at all, any minuscule research at all, you can see the garbage is flowing in our ocean. And it starts from Rochester. It starts from Tenino. It starts from Tacoma, so on and so forth. What I love about Germany is in Germany, they pay people, not ask for volunteers, to pick up trash. They pay people to pick up trash. So in Germany, they call them the behinder. And behinder, for lack of a better word, is handicap in English. So they pay the handicap, or lesser intelligent, if you will, to put on an orange suit, grab a broom, and sweep and clean up their communities. You know? Instead of asking for volunteers, let's pay a little bit of money to these people that are, we're sitting up here talking about homeless and all this other good stuff. Yes, there's people that have issues. Some people have alcohol and drug related issues, but there's people that really want to work. Let's give them a little bit of money and clean up our communities because our communities are disgusting compared to Europe and Germany. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Please, anybody else, you're invited up if you'd like to address the board. Going, going. Gone. Thank you. <laughs> now we're moving back on with the agenda, and this is uh, number two on the agenda. We all have already made it to number two. County manager's uh, update. Yeah, I have a, uh, can you hear me? Not enough. No. Can you hear me? Talk like, yeah. Talk like, there you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you it's go. Better. Okay. So um, I'd like to follow up. Uh, as you know, during your uh, regular house at the at the at the court um, at the courthouse, room 280, we provide accommodations for hearing and impair. And when the board of county commissioners goes on the road, becomes a little bit of a challenge. But we do provide, and we do have availability to provide assistance to the hearing and impair, because we do have a portable unit. So. I just want to make sure the public understands when we go out, we do provide those services as well as we provide at the courthouse. Um, I'd like to follow up to some of the uh, public testimony you received last week. And um, this is, uh, you received a similar testimony uh, related to the North Point application that, uh, that you have. And um, let me get my notes. And I will not be, um, addressing those individual comments because you're, um, you will be reviewing that uh, next Tuesday 
to a larger context where you will be providing um, a direction to staff as to how you like to address this particular application. So stay tuned. Uh, this item on the North Point is going to be included on the agenda setting for next Tuesday, uh, May 7th. And the agenda setting starts at 9 in the morning and will be live streaming uh, the whole meeting uh, just in case you are not able to attend physically to the courthouse. Uh, some of the, and again, one of the public testimony that you receive uh, was from Miss, uh, let me get to it. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Tina Danielson, and she was providing testimony related to a uh, non-compliance property next to the LP uh, Brown Elementary School um, in Olympia, in the UGA. So uh, obviously her testimony was heartfelt. Uh, she was frustrated in terms of uh, how many uh, years the county has taken in addressing this nuisance uh, property as she described. And also I believe this morning the board shared her frustrations on how long it has taken the, the county to address, uh, quote unquote, uh, this issue. Um, and uh, this morning you directed me to contact uh, your prosecuting attorney to determine what legal options you may have available to you both as a Board of County Commissioners as well as, the, as a Board of Health and see what else uh, you can do perhaps to expedite the process because the staff at this point is proceeding uh, on the um, elements that we have available to us uh, based on the, on the uh, county code, Title 26. So um, I will follow up with a phone call to Mr. Danielson um, explaining uh, some of the steps that you have taken in the direction you have given me this morning. That's all I have for you. Um, Thanks, sir. Any questions or comments for the county manager? No, sir. No. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, number three on the agenda is consent items A and B. I would move to approve consent items A and B. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, the consent items A and B. Any discussion on those issues? No, sir. No? No. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 That carries. Thank you. <clears throat> and now department items. The emergency services resolution to enter into an interlocal agreement for disaster recovery. Kurt Harden. There's uh, Kurt Harden, Director of Emergency Services, uh, coming to you to request the Board of County Commissioners approve a resolution for Thurston County to enter into an agreement with other jurisdictions in Thurston County for disaster recovery in the event of a major or catastrophic disaster. This past February, jurisdictions across Thurston County participate in a three-day FEMA exercise on catastrophic disaster recovery. The exercise focused on impacts uh, and recovery from a large-scale Cascadia subduction zone disaster. Participants worked to identify issues requiring regional coordination for long-term recovery process. These areas that were <clears> focused <throat> on included schools, jobs, housing, and health. There was concurrence to pursue a unified regional approach to disaster recovery planning and implementation. A regional approach to disaster recovery benefits Thurston County by ensuring a comprehensive integrated understanding of countywide recovery goals, strengthening partnerships and working relationships within the whole community, and creating a process to make prompt, effective post-disaster decisions to reduce recovery timeframes, costs, and hardships. The Thurston County Emergency Management Council is developing an interlocal agreement to formalize the work group to recreate a recovery planning process. And this supports Thurston County Strategic Plan Initiative for strengthened emergency management planning and community disaster preparedness. So therefore, subject to your questions, I request that you approve the resolution. Do you have any questions, Kurt? I don't have questions, no. No, sir. I fully support this. Uh, based on the natural, the uh, FEMA conference we all went to. I'm very happy to see her finally, finally. All right. I would move to approve a resolution for Thurston County to enter into an interlocal agreement with other jurisdictions in Thurston County for disaster recovery 
in the event of a major or catastrophic disaster. Second. Been moved and seconded uh, to enter into the interlocal agreement for disaster recovery. Any further discussion? No. I just, uh, folks may not know that uh, Commissioner Edwards some years ago had attained, uh, attended a training and Commissioner Hutchings and I got to attend a similar training in February where we basically simulated preparation for a very major disaster. And it was a huge uh, group of people from all over the county, including school district representatives, inner city transit, South County mayors, and uh, you know just every, every piece of the community you could think of participating and thinking through how we would respond. Um, so this is kind of a reflection of the, the work that was done there. And the thing that I was really proud of, kind of speaking to the, to the uh, woman who was so proud of being in Thurston County, made me really proud to be in Thurston County because what we had uh, FEMA trainers who trained uh, groups all over the nation and they worked with communities from all over the nation and they were just, when the elected leaders and other community groups got together in breakout groups and tried to figure out how we would collaborate and cooperate, they were absolutely floored and said they'd never seen that type of cooperation among jurisdictions as they saw here in Thurston County. The relationships that we have, the respect that we have between different municipalities and county government and I was really proud to be part of that. And so to, to move this process forward with this, this is just a first step, but it's a good first step and it's something I think we can all be proud of. And you were instrumental in bringing FEMA all the way out here just for Thurston County for this training. And it was wonderful. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Thank you. And it was interesting to see that uh, philosophically, and now we're moving into the hard onto paper, that when the big 7, 8, 9.0 subduction earthquake happens, and Lacey's gone, Rochester, everywhere else, from the coast on in, that all these jurisdictional boundaries and egos evaporate. And now as people come together, how do we fix, how do we repair, how do we get back, back going on our feet again? So I'm really happy to see this finally. Good, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, so it's been uh, moved and seconded, has it been? Yes, seconded. To accept this agreement, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that motion carries. Thank you, Kurt. Item number five, Public Works. This is a resolution affirming the proposed formation of the Summer Lake Special Use District and submitting the formation of the district to a vote of qualified voters pursuant to RCW 85.38.060. Good evening, you, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Tim Wilson. I'm the Water Resources Manager, Thurston County Public Works. In September 2018, Thurston County received a petition from property owners at Summit Lake asking the Board of County Commissioners to form a Summit Lake Special Use District. The petition contained the signatures of 31 individuals exceeding the 10 si signatures required by statute. Upon receipt of the petition, the Board of County Commissioners directed the county engineer to review the proposed boundary and assess the financial feasibility of the proposal, consistent with RCW 8538030. The county engineer determined the proposed boundary is, is reasonable and the proposed goals appear feasible. Per RCW 8538-040, the Board of County Commissioners held a public hearing on April 2nd, 2019 to hear comments from persons affected by the proposal. 94 comments were received at the public hearing. Pursuant to RCW, the next step in considering formation is for the Board of County Commissioners to authorize the Thurston County Auditor to put the question of whether to form Summit Lake Special Use District to a vote of qualified voters within the proposed district for the special election date of August 6, 2019. For clarification, the action requested by staff today does not form the SUD but rather puts a question of formation to qualified voters within the proposed district. With that, staff is respectfully requesting that the Board of County Commissioners move to affirm the proposed formation of the Summit Lake Special Use District and authorize the Thurston County Auditor to submit the formation of the district to a vote of qualified voters pursuant to RCW 853860. Any questions or comments? Uh, yes, uh, Tim, <clears throat> and what, uh, you gave a number of how many people testified or submitted comments, and what was the ratio of pro or against? Or? 94 uh, individuals provided either testimony, testimony, either verbal or written, 
at the public hearing. 36 uh, were for the formation, 58 were opposed. And uh, how many people submitted a petition out, or how many parcels, I don't know how you had, it, had that divided out. How many people or parcels submitted a petition to have this uh, district created out of the, uh, I don't know, four or 500 properties out there? There were 31 uh, petitioners, signatures on the petition that were verified as uh, property owners uh, within the boundaries of the proposed district. Okay, thank you. Commissioner comments? No. I do. So uh, go right back to uh, Commissioner Edwards. The, the 30 or 31, what does state law accept as a minimum petition number? State law requires that uh, 10 signatures be on a petition. A minimum for of 10. Formation. So it's state law, revised code of Washington, that allows a group of citizens to initiate a process. They're allowed to do that per RCW. And so uh, three times the minimum number, still not near as, you know, like 400 folks that live out there, but they exceeded that. We've had the public hearing, and this is self-initiated. It's not the county initiating. It's, it's folks at Summit Lake, not all of them, but, but a lot of them out there. And the county's not taxing them. They're, they just want this to go on in the process to go to a ballot so they at Summit Lake can determine their own fate. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so we're not, we're just allowing it, the process to continue per state law. Correct. Okay, I've got nothing further. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, how many folks get to vote on this particular issue? I guess what I'm referring to, if they own property, do they automatically get to vote or do they ha have to live and be registered at that location to get to vote? To be a qualified voter, you have to be a registered voter within the district. Uh, the way the RCWs um, um, direct this is that each parcel um, gets two votes. So. Uh, but if a, uh, if a parcel is owned by a husband and wife or two individuals, each individual gets one vote on that parcel. Do you have anything? So, Tim, <laughs> if I want to vote for a commissioner, I'd have to be a registered voter in this district or in this county, correct? I would defer to the county auditor. <laughs> okay. That's a good answer, boy. That's a good answer. All right, got nothing further. Thank you, Tim. All right, sir, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, and here's the dilemma that I find myself in. So I would defer uh, to a, another commissioner to make this motion as I am ready to vote, but not ready to make a motion. Sure. Okay. okay. I move to affirm the proposed formation of Special Lake Summit, Summit Lake Special Use District, authorizing Thurston County Auditor to submit the formation of the district to a vote of qualified voters pursuant to RCW 85 38060. And I second that motion. Is there any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Uh, I would just say that I, I don't feel this is fair because the majority of property owners are not going to be able to vote in this election. Is that true? The majority of property owners are not going to be allowed to vote? Or do we know that? Can't speak to that. Okay. Uh, if you would like, I would. I could call on somebody from the audience, depending on how much. Well, you got a lifeline. You know, how much, well, <laughs> no. uh, I mean, we're in a situation here where it is taxation without representation. There is another process, and that's called the Lake Management District. That I feel is a fair process in which each property owner gets to vote and has a say in the taxation process that they may or may not uh, impose on themselves. So right. for that reason, I'm taking the stand. All right. And uh, taxation without representation typically is, is refers to government taxation, and this is not that at all. That's correct. Uh, I, I, I guess I do want to comment that if they do not tax, if they do not pay their tax, they don't get away free. They get a lien on their property. They could lose their property. So it's uh, it's the same thing. It's uh, a pretty stiff burden that could be imposed on individuals 
that have no say. So You're that's, absolutely right. That's the There's a thing. consequence for every decision yes. we make. Some are good consequences, some aren't. I got it. Yes. Um, I just want to say I support the staff's recommendation. There's a history of water quality, serious water quality problems at Summit Lake. They're still ongoing to this day. There's, we heard a lot of good arguments on both sides about the formation of a special use district. It's a conversation, obviously, the community needs to have there through this process. I have no idea if they need a special use district or not. I'm not a resident. I'm not going to be participating in that community conversation. But I feel it would be irris they've done a proper petition. A lot of good arguments have been made. At this juncture, I feel it would be irresponsible of me and anti-democratic to remove their ability to move forward with the process. Um, the, the, the residents, uh, you know, it's their right to choose. And um, Mr. Wood's comment, he may be absolutely accurate that it's going to fail because a, a majority of who showed up to the meeting, slight majority, wasn't opposed. But there are a lot of good arguments, and they're going to continue to communicate with each other and campaign and probably discuss it. And they'll decide for themselves, and I want them to have that chance. So that's why I'm supporting staff's recommendation. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Well, I guess I, I would have to finish off with there are other alternatives that could be imposed <clears throat> by that community on itself with the help of Thurston County. I think as uh, county commissioners, we are obligated to help the residents with the existing taxes they pay and possibly create a lake management district that would be a much fairer taxing process. Okay, so I'm going to call for the vote. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Item number six. Uh, the county uh, commissioners and managers up there. This is the uh, ballot measure. There we go. You want to frame that? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, the existing hilltop side of Thurston County government and the courts include buildings one through six. Buildings one and three were constructed in 1978 and, uh, or, and our original, which are the original part of the complex. Over the last 40 years, the county has purchased building four and six, which now they're located across the street. The existing buildings for uh, the county government and the courts in their current state are at the end of the useful life, uh, costing significant taxpayer dollars to maintain and operate. The current layout and design are also making it difficult for citizens to locate resources and services in a timely manner. In 2015, as well as in 2018, the Thurston County conducted uh, feasibility studies for the purpose uh, to provide the county with a long-term solution to housing courts and other county administrative functions in an efficient and cost-effective manner. In, two in the 2018 <coughs> study, at the direction of the county, conducted further analysis on three sites, the existing hilltop site of Thurston County government and the courts, the Plum Street site which was formerly um, original, the original uh, Olympia City Hall, which is also housed the current uh, City of Olympia Creighton Justice Center. And the third side was uh, the Harrison West, which is currently underdeveloped on the west side of Olympia. The Board of County Commissioners uh, reviewed those three sites <laughs> and determined a majority of the vote that, per that perhaps the Plum Street was the preferred site as moved forward. RCW 8455050 provides for the levy of regular property taxes in the amount exceeding the limitation specified in Chapter 8455 of the RCW. Time to read it. Yeah, if such increase, increased levy is authorized by the ballot proposition approved by the majority of the voters at an election held within the taxing district, also we call the levy lead lift. The proposal, uh, the proposed proposition that you may be considering today um, uh, includes a uh, uh, tax levy rate of uh, 47 cents per 1,000 valuation of the assessed value, and that is authorized again under uh, 8455 with the RCW. 
The total regular property tax uh, rate produced an estimated to be approximate $1.69 per 1,000. This is the assessed value of 2019. And this valuation could change at uh, the time that you, uh, as a board, decide to put this uh, on, on in front of the voters. Also, 84, uh, 55 of the RCW um, includes a 25-year maximum of uh, levy, lev uh, uh, levy rate of this proposal. You said uh, public hearing, uh, which you uh, provided, uh, you uh, received public testimony on April 23, 2019. Leading to the public hearing, you received 31 uh, written testimonies. Uh, out of the 31, um, eight was in support of this measure, 11, 12 were, were against, and 11 uh, were not necessarily one way or the other, it was miscellaneous comments. During the public hearing, you received 17 verbal uh, test public testimony, of which 10 were in favor, and seven in opposition. On Thursday, uh, April 25th, you held a briefing where the, um, the consultant provided you with a survey that was conducted to the citizens uh, and the county related to this particular matter. I'm not planning to walk you through the survey because that was very detailed as they provided to you. Um, moving on to uh, Monday, yesterday, you review all the public testimony that you receive, both in, in writing as well as uh, verbal testimony. You consider the, uh, the survey results. And also, you had a briefing from the uh, board, uh, bond council that gives you perspective as to how the financial aspects of the potential measure related to a bond measure will, be, uh, will apply to the county. You have a discussion, you had a discussion yesterday where the board um, agreed on a two to one vote to bring this, uh, this item to your attention as a formal vote today. Um, it was a two to one, uh, Commissioner Edwards uh, voted against it. So this uh, particular item for your consideration is for you to um, bring this matter in front of the voters for the, on the April 28th, 2020 a special election. Any questions? All right. Uh, questions or comments of the county manager? Uh, no, I'll save my comments for discussion. Are you on? I'll save, save my. There you go. For discussion. Okay. I'll save my comments for discussion. Anything up front? Uh, I think up front, um, our assistant county manager, who's also our budget director, we had, as a question for her, we had a couple of public comments today and last week about the. the tax increase proposal proposal for the voters to consider and the percentage of, of property tax 39.5 is that the to, is that the amount of the total property tax that a property owner could expect to see increase under this proposal so property taxpayers uh, will not see their total property tax increase by 39 and a half percent. What they'll see is the portion that comes to the county general fund, which is um, less than 10 percent on, on, or 10 cents on the dollar. Um, it's, it's that small amount in their property tax that will increase by 39 and a half percent. So right now, um, the county rate uh, for the general fund is a dollar twenty-two per thousand. Uh, it will increase to a dollar sixty-seven per thousand, or that would have been the proposal for if the um, tax were to begin in 2020. Uh, we'll have to do the calculation, but that forty-seven cents per thousand is the increase, and that works out to approximately twelve dollars a month. On a median home price? Of $275,000, yes. Okay. That was the only question I had up front to clarify. You said it back last week that, because I'm, whenever I vote, it, it'll impact me as well if this passes. And if my taxes were going to go up 39.5%, I wouldn't vote for it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Are we uh, good for, 
Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Yeah. Are we good for discussion at this point? Are we I can make a motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I'll make the yeah. motion to submit to qualified electors of the county at a special election to be held on April 28, 2020, of a proposition authorizing the county to levy pr regular property taxes in excess of limitations of Chapter 8455 RCW and setting forth the text of the ballot proposition for the purpose of constructing a new courthouse and regional administration building. And I second that motion, and now it's open for discussion. It's been moved and seconded. Let's discuss. Go ahead, Gary. Okay. Uh, I first want to say that I do know that we have a need to address safety issues at the courthouse, where the courts are doing business and the criminal justice component resides. But the reality is we don't have enough money in Thurston County. Am I dying out? No, but the mic is. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Can you hear me? No. Nope. How about now? How about now? Yeah. How about now? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we don't have enough money to hire deputy sheriffs to patrol our streets and keep our community safe. I just don't think that a $300 million investment in downtown Olympia is the right place to go. I realize that we need to do something with the courts, but I am very much in favor of some type of a remodel. I don't know what that will consist of because I don't feel, I think we're a little premature on getting this thing going. So uh, I took an opportunity on the way down here. I drove through Little Rock and stopped at the Little Rock, uh, in the Little Rock store area. And I asked 10 people if they would be interested or what they thought about the courthouse without prefacing it as to how I felt. All 10 of them said that they did not favor it but about five of them used language that I can't repeat here at this function. So I've talked to a lot of bureaucrats uh, throughout the county, mainly around the city of Olympia and government employees, and they're very much in favor of this. But I have not talked to citizens that have been in favor of it. And I believe we're missing the boat by moving ahead. We spent $30,000 on an Elway study. And that study recommended that this was going to be an uphill battle, to say the least. So I think uh, although we need to fix some things at the courthouse, I don't believe this is a proper expenditure of taxpayers' money at this point in time. So I'll just don't let it go with that. Thank you. Commissioner Minister? Um, yeah, I, I agree that we need uh, something to change with our court complex. It's not safe. It's not designed correctly. It's for, for court proceedings. The space is the biggest issue. I mean, we're, list, we're looking at district court operating on 50% of the available space that we need today and we're gonna grow by 40% in the next 20 years. So uh, we're just gonna outgrow, forget about the condition, the location, anything else, we're gonna completely outgrow the facility. Doesn't mean you have to build a new building, but th those are the issues that we're, we're grappling with. Um, we have a, a facility that's gonna cost us $50 million over the next, next decade to perpetuate its, its life, uh, which is, it's not, you know, and the, and the cost estimate I believe that we're talking about here is more in the range of $250 million. So we're gonna spend 20% of the, of the project just propping up a building that has used, re reached the end of its normal life. Um, a lot of effort, so this was a community need. I was an attorney before I became a commissioner, and I, so I was hearing the judges talking about it, and I've been hearing about this for five years plus of how we were gonna address this, and a process was put in place under the previous Board of County Commissioners to, to, to get community input, to hire the right people that really knew what they were doing about we had bond consultants. How do we deal with it financially? How do we deal with it structurally? They put together a plan that they thought was the best plan to address this need. Um, 
There might be other ways to do it, but, but I came on board in January. I think this is well thought out in terms of, uh, of all the considerations that we have. And ultimately, it's going to be up to the voters. We're not taxing anyone anything. We're asking voters if, if they will approve this financing structure. If they say no, we're going to have to do something else um, because the need's not going to go away. So we're just going to have to go back to the drawing board. But so much work and investment has gone into bringing this process to this place that it deserves to go to the voters. Um, and I'd like to see it do that. And we will um, provide information to the voters about it and they will make the decision. But I think this is the right decision for our community at this time. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I, uh, I agree with my seatmate on some of the issues. And uh, my concern is that this, this can't pass. I mean, I just, I think I've got a good pulse of the community. And I'm worried that by not passing, we're locked into a worse situation than if we would put, hit the pause button and rethink some of this and utilize uh, Mr. Thomas's uh, work, actually both Thomas's, we can still use the work that they've done if we hit the pause button and rethink this and see if we can't come up with something that's a little better, I'll just put it that way. I'm going to try to be polite here. Uh, because if we hit the pause button, we can use this information maybe a, for a couple years, it will be very relevant. But my fear is if this thing is voted down, then we're kind of stuck. The last time the county took a run at this was in 2004, got voted down. Here we are 15 years later trying it again. I just don't think it is put together properly. Uh, I think we're in a rush, so uh, that's why I'm taking the stance I am. So I, and I respect the point of view, and that's what I, I mentioned to you folks earlier tonight. We'll have an interesting discussion, and this is, this is sausage making, if you will, in the legislative process. So. Oh, no, sir, no, no questions. This is first time, thank you. Uh, I'll respond to that because you, my wife and I live in an 1,800 square foot home with a couple of domestic animals. And to use your words, the house needs some fixing. We need to fix some things. But the county is a, the, the courthouse and administrative support businesses or, or buildings are uh, it's a money pit. And I'm not gonna get into the whys, but it was built on the cheap, was because it extended uh, its useful life, whatever the reasons. Um, but I believe we're spending over a million in maintenance of the building but I know we're spending a million a year in repairs, just in repairs in the buildings, what I've been told. Uh, it's a considerable amount of money. I agree, if we do nothing, we're stuck. If it goes to the ballot and it's voted down, we're stuck. For me, it's a wash there. Uh, and again, I'm not doing anything other than letting the citizens vote. And if the citizens say no, it's a no. If it's okay, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. And when the uh, Stuart Elway survey came back, it was very definite that the public just does not know what the issues are. They're not engaged. Uh, they may go to the courthouse and get a license or pay their taxes and they leave. They're safe. They found a place to park. Everything's just fine. But they truly don't know because they're not fully engaged or educated. We're, we haven't educated them enough on what the, what the issues are. So there's a huge gap between what the citizens know and what their perception is and what their reality is. And now we will have time, if we do this, to inform the public. And if they still say no, well, we've lost this time and time and money. Uh, but if they say yes, then we can do something effective in collaboration with another jurisdiction to bring some uh, well-needed uh, relief to the county employees and, uh, and also consolidation of services and saving huge amounts of money in, uh, in power costs as well. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to it, and I'm not gonna sit here and sell it. And sell it, because we're just voting whether we're going to move it to an election or to a ballot or not. So uh, we're not deciding right now that it's gonna, what the vote will be, but we're, we're, we're just voting on move the process along. Um, so do you have anything, do you have anything further, Gary? No, sir. Do you have anything further? I just wanted to, you did mention another jurisdiction and I just, I don't think people completely realize that the, 
Tumwater and Lacey Municipal Court functions are count contracted with the county. Olympia is separate in a separate facility. The opportunity to combine them into one would completely unify our court system in a way that would be uh, a really good benefit to the community, the criminal justice system. So um, it's just another factor in there. And no matter what happens, the Thomas Brothers, you've done a great job on this, on this project. I thank you very much, and I applaud your, your efforts and your work. Thank you. And Stuart Elway, too. Um, so we have a, a motion and a second. And any further discussion? No? Yes? No? no. Yeah, yeah I, I would. I'd, I'd like to say one other thing. The site location was probably one of the bigger issues that the Elway study came out and said that's where the public debate would be. And that is also a big concern of mine. I can't imagine it. We're trying to build a hundred year building. We're going to build it in an area that's susceptible to a floodplain, uh, earthquake. The city's talking about a seawall that they're going to build. Uh, and the homeless thing that the city has just let get out of control down there. Uh, I, can't, I can't find people in the county that want to go to the city of Olympia uh, they use terrible terms when they describe the city of Olympia, and I just think they're so adamant that this is the wrong approach. So that's the end of it. So before I call for the vote, I'm going to ask staff, um, seawall, flooding, mitigation for that type of stuff, that's all been taken into account in uh, earthquakes, in the design, structure, location, height, pil pylons, everything has been accounted for uh, with uh, regard? In the, in the feasibility study that uh, Ron Thomas uh, provided to you, it did take into account uh, the high level water potential uh, sea level rise. And the elevation where the plum Street is located is above uh, the maximum high water. Also, the, the structural conditions of not just this side, but um, across downtown, uh, Olympia requires piling meaning going deeper on the foundation of any building until they can reach a uh, solid uh, rock bed. And, uh, and that is uh, part of the feasibility study that also includes that uh, strategy, um, which makes it a seismic uh, retrofit building uh, adequate for those conditions. All that uh, was included in the feasibility study as well as in the um, preliminary cost estimate. And so with that being said, I'll get to you saying, I'm not a Pollyanna thinking, oh, we got to build it. It's going to be a beautiful world. Nor am I gloom and doom, the, the, the sea level, the, all that, because it's been taken care of. So when we educate the public, it's incumbent upon whomever's educating the public, educate them with fact and not fiction, or fact and what, uh, what the actual documented needs are and how it would be addressed. Yeah. So those issues have not been taken care of uh, with all the respect, Commissioner. They have been assessed as part of the feasibility study. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I, you can just, wrap it up then. I just want to say that I'm not going to get into the site location because that was a different vote at a different time. Um, I, am, I am solidly convinced that the, the location that was chosen was the right one. And I've laid out my reasons in great detail in the previous meeting. You can check that online. Um, absolutely confident that that's the right, that we chose the right place. If we're going to, if we're going to build this building and the voters want to, want us to move forward, it's going to be a, a good project. And it's going to be good for our community. It's going to be good for Thurston County. Oh, Gary. Uh, again, as to the site location, I have every confidence that the architects and engineers have got this figured out for that building. I believe it could probably survive a earthquake in that location that happens to be on fill, but with the proper engineering, that can be made solid and it could survive a major earthquake. The problem is all the infrastructure that leads to and from that location, the sewer pipe that goes to lot, the water pipe, the roads, they're all sitting on that same fill and their antiquated construction around that area that we'll have no control over. And if the wrong situation develops, we're going to be an island on ourselves. Uh, there in that location, won't be able to flush the toilet, won't have anything to drink, but we'll have a building that's fine. And uh, for a lot of different reasons, that's why I think we need more thought. 
Anyway, thank you for cons uh, well, for tolerating my point of view. Of course, well, people need to hear it. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right, motion carries. And 6B is called for sealed bids for the official county newspaper of record for 2019-2020. Last but not least, <laughs> and uh, this is a yearly event where you um, uh, select a potential bidder to provide the services as the official county newspaper. Uh, the current uh, newspaper is the Olympian, and the current contract with the Olympian ends on June 30th, 2019. Uh, we ask the commissioners to authorize um, issuing the uh, call for bids to determine uh, what will be the outfit or the newspaper that can serve as the official uh, newspaper for all the legal notices the county utilizes. In this particular contract, we'll go for um, another year from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Okay. Questions of, of staff regarding this? No, sir. No. Okay. <clears throat> I'm ready, if you are. I would like to move to approve a call for sealed bids for the official county newspaper for the period of July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020, and set Monday, June 3rd, 2019 at 9 a.m. for the opening of the bids. Second. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded to call for sealed bids for the uh, official county newspaper for 19 and 20. <coughs> Any further discussion on that? No, sir. No. Nope. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Whew. Now we get to the commissioner's reporting on what we've done over the last week. You want to go first? Well, I guess I'll just, uh, it, it kind of sounds like I'm a broken record here when I talk about working on, my, my week was spent mostly on the environment, mostly on water quality, <coughs> rather than water quantity. I know a big push through the Hearst decision was water uh, quantity, but I think the priority, because here we are living in western Washington, we get a fair amount of rain, but I think we need to pay attention to water quality. And I'm hoping that uh, this board will work on that particular topic with me as the year goes on. Thank you. That's it? That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, we've been here a long time. I'll try to keep it somewhat short. I was down here in this area for the Shale and Basin Partnership meeting on, fr on last Friday, where we're working on the watershed plan for Chehalis River uh, under the Streamflow Restoration Act. I uh, attended a uh, Capital Land Trust fundraising breakfast. I attended a open house for the new family support centers uh, facilities in West Olympia. Attended a new uh, open house for the Olympia Free Clinic in downtown Olympia. They've got new space next to the community care center. That was a real treat. Uh, attended with Commissioner Hutchings a um, installation service for uh, Bishop uh, Lorenzo Peterson at the New Life Baptist Church. We were we were uh, invited, and so we wanted to wish him to uh, welcome him to the community and we attended that, and then I uh, had a meeting with um, stakeholders of the South Sound chapter of the Puget Sound Partnership Salmon uh, Leadership Council, which uh, I'm gonna be taking over the representation for all of South Sound for the salmon recovery efforts in Puget Sound. Excuse me, I'll do a quick rundown as well. Attended the Monarch uh, fourth annual fundraising breakfast. Monarch is a children's sexual assault clinic in Lacey. Um, in fact, all three of us were there for that. Uh, Capital Land Trust breakfast, uh, the Economic Development Board meeting. I'm a member of the, of the EDC board. APWA is the Public Works Association. And uh, Romero and I, along with Jennifer uh, Walker, the Public Works Director, attended a banquet in Tacoma at the Convention Center because our Public Works were awarded uh, a state award for the uh, fish passage barrier removal projects that we've done. And can I announce it or is it a spoiler? And they're going to be awarded a national award for the work with the fish barrier passage removal, which is dadgum cool. That's just really exciting. Uh, and a f cool dinner as well. Uh, Pack Mountain, the Work Development Consortium. I attended that meeting on Friday where we talk about internships and apprenticeships and getting people back to work in every way we can. And then uh, yesterday or last evening, attended the Turin 
tourism promotion area uh, meeting. It's a bunch of hoteliers, and you'd think it wouldn't be fun, but it's interesting. Talking about heads in beds and uh, the plans and strategies, the new and upcoming events, and how to promote more beds and more people staying in hotels in Thurston County. Uh, that was always, that's always an entertaining, um, entertaining function. And that was the extent of my week. County Manager. Um, briefly, let me walk you through uh, to, of your upcoming um, meetings uh, for the next week. Uh, the appointments that I will be mentioning in my report is where at least two commissioners will be present. Uh, you may have individual appointments on your individual calendars. Those will not be part of my report. Starting tomorrow, Wednesday, the first and night in, in the morning, you will have a briefing related to the inventory of capitalized assets in the county. At uh, 11.15, you will have the opportunity to welcome new employees to the county. And at 2 in the afternoon, you have a Board of Health briefing related to the Board of Health orientation. Thursday, May 2nd, uh, 9 in the morning, you have a briefing related to the compliance process. At 10, uh, you have your regular commissioner's check-in, where an agenda will be published 24 hours in advance. At 1 in the afternoon, May 2nd, you have uh, your monthly Superior Court update. 2.30 in the afternoon, you have the TST. In 2019, the Treatment Sales Tax Community Grant Recommendations. And uh, at 6 in the evening on Thursday, May 2nd, you have a joint meeting with the uh, Lacey City Council. And uh, we already have posted an agenda. Uh, you will have the opportunity to meet with your fellow elected officials from Lacey. Nothing on um, Friday, May 3rd. And on Monday, May 6th, begins the, uh, the Public Service Recognition Week. You will have, you have been invited to participate in several events during that week. And, um, and you will come back here on Tuesday, no here, at the courthouse on May 7th, where you will be reviewing the agenda for that evening uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting. Thank you. Uh, seatmates, anything for the good of the order? I can't think of anything, nope. Then thank you, Rochester. We're adjourned. Thank you.